Good morning, everyone. Turn to Psalm 107, please, as we start. I need some verses by way of encouragement in a number of ways for us here. We'll just we're going to be reading the first nine verses. There's a series of circumstances here that are laid out in Psalm 107, kind of follow the same template. We read, O Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way and found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses, and he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Let's uh, look to him now as we open. Father, we've just read one of many um, passages that express your grace to us, your mercy. We certainly thank you again and again for that provision. We, it gives us assurance as we approach you and as we approach this time in your word that you are for us and not against us as your children and that you will deliver us from any distress as we avail ourselves of your provision and cry out to you. Father, right now our need is to be focused on what you have for us in your word today, both this hour and other hours and in other services, uh, classes here. So we pray that each one would be careful to lay aside any distraction that you might have full attention of each of us this morning. We commit our time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll get back to Galatians in a minute, but first I want to share some thoughts relative to a matter that I mentioned Wednesday night uh, for those who were here last night, I had this all prepared before the pastor's session. So this is another one of those cases of, I think, the Spirit working together in various uh, ways to choreograph what we get here by way of teaching and fellowship. I I have been embroiled in an unresolved matter since early 2011 concerning a lawsuit that was brought against the town of Ledyard and of which I had become the prime target of the plaintiff to the point of personal attack. And I'm being told that I have to put on my leash. (laughs) Without my glasses, it's hard to see what's going on in the balcony. Mark's jumping up and down, waving. Well, not exactly. We all set? Okay. It turns out that I came to be as much on trial as the town. I ended up giving around four hours of time on the stand. And the implications for me and the town in this matter were great. There had been a number of twists and turns, but there had never been closure in the matter. As I mentioned for prayer, we had entered this last week the final At long last, the final trial and the decision was pending because there had been long gaps of direct involvement for over two years. I hadn't personally realized how much this matter had been an underlying source of anxiety for me and how much I really hadn't rested in the Lord over it specifically. But now we had reached the final stage and it was upon me in full force. I found there were so many relevant truths that we had been looking at in the various studies, and the one that finally gripped me as this came to a close was what we've been hearing from Hebrews 3 and 4 on Saturday night in the pastor's study. It's a detour from the uh, the Exodus study, and I'm so glad he took that detour. Uh, It seemed to be there, for me at least, just in time, and it didn't hurt that Uh, for this last week that Jesse Abel had adopted it as the theme of his devotional in the morning. One of the important things I had to acknowledge is that even though I knew it was a matter of resting in the Lord, his rest will not come by simply cycling various promises through my mind. 
I had to deal with any unbelief that I had failed to acknowledge, specifically as we've seen, with regard to God's provision in the way and the time He wants to supply it. I had to view my unbelief as coming from an evil heart. We need to really see unbelief for the evil that it is, as related to us in Hebrews 3 and in Romans 7 that we've seen a few times, where Paul says, I find evil present in me, the one who desires to do good. I know the world thinks that actually worry is a good thing. Somehow it shows that you're caring. But beyond the fact that we recognize that evil, uh, that worry is sin, we have to recognize worry is from an evil heart. I had to confess, confess this unbelief and completely accept before the Lord whatever His will would end up being in the matter. Not just insist on what I felt was the best outcome for me, or even the just outcome from my perspective. Now, I briefly shared this situation and my personal struggle with it for prayer Wednesday night, and uh, I could really sense the, the prayer as I came to the close of this going into Thursday morning. And this all seemed to come together at the right time. When I walked into the courtroom on the third and final day of the trial this last Thursday, I had finally entered God's rest. I had accepted as a real possibility that God could allow injustice, at least from my and many others' perspectives. He could allow that to prevail. Does God allow injustice? Do we find this as a biblical reality? Can, has, and does He work through injustice to accomplish His purposes? These are really dumb questions, I know. <laughs> Uh, but we must take this beyond the biblical theoretical acknowledgement to the practical. So I had come to be prepared to accept whatever God's will was in the matter and was able to then, only then, apply all kinds of other relevant truth to the situation from a perspective of that peace. The peace spoken of in Philippians 4.7 and in Isaiah 26.3. Thursday morning, our uh, closing arguments were offered, followed by the judge's decision. And when the judge ruled in the town's favor, it was as if I didn't even feel any further relief, since I had already entered the place of God's rest. I am, of course, thankful for that, and also thankful in the end for God's provision of the, of the favorable outcome. When I finally took counsel from Hebrews 3 and 4 regarding the stipulations concerning God's rest and submitted fully to them, there was victory. Uh, we are all finding that the Christian life is a lifelong series of various degrees of tests and trials that God works through in our lives to His glory. When we accept life on these terms, we approach life on these terms, and we take our time in the Word and our function as a local body more seriously. Now, I, I hope you found that encouraging by way of a word of testimony. Be sure of this. Our time in Hebrews 3 and 4 was not just for me. <laughs> There are undoubtedly trials in your life. If you're not experiencing them now, you will be experiencing them as you, as God sees, the, sees you taking this teaching seriously. All right, let's now go to Galatians 6. We're going to go ahead and we're in the last section now, so let's uh, read from 11 through 18. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ 
by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walked according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now we've made it down through verse 14. And I just about had to put it on fast forward trying to finish that last week. So after a quick review or a few quick reminders about verses 11 through 13, I'll try at least to recount the key points from verse 14. Verse 11 was Paul's way of capturing and directing the Galatians' attention one final time. In verses 12 through 13, he offers a strong final appeal regarding the motives of those who had led them astray, the Judaizers, which we saw laid out in this outline that was offered by Dr. Jeremiah. So he identified through verses 12 and 13 these motives of the Judaizers with regard to the Galatians, but these could be applied to any legalizer, as it were. First, the approval of the people. Second, the avoidance of persecution. Third, the appearance of perfection. And fourth, the attitude of pride. So those are motives we saw Paul laid out, lay, laid out here in verses 12 through 13, which we've already looked at. And in verse 14, Paul shifted by way of a strong contrast. He says, God forbid, may genoita, or more literally, may it never be, which is typically how the New American Standard renders it in a more literal form. He, Paul, proclaims unequivocally, in contrast to the legalists, that he would take no occasion to boast or glory in himself or in his flesh in some way. We saw from a couple passages the great extent to which Paul could have had cause to such boasting, and that simply added weight to Paul's point here. Not that it tempted him to do that, but he was laying it out to show by way of contrast he could likewise boast in the same way. So it added weight to his point. Instead, Paul would not boast except, as we read, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He presents unmistakably the only basis for true boasting, the cross of Christ. And then he points out practical implications of the mindset of glorying in the cross of Christ. And he says, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. First, he says, the world has been crucified to me. In that we find that in Christ, the world of mankind has been rendered crucified to the believer, both in its individual constituents, in other words, Christ died for each person, and also in the world's character, i.e. the viewpoint of life apart from God. There are two main facets to this, to the world being crucified to the believer. First, we see the, the, in the cross we recognize the rendering of the world system inoperative. The forces behind the world system are defeated. Many commentators stop here because in the Greek the word cosmos, speaking of the world, doesn't have a definite article. And, though, and because of that, they say it has a more general application. And, and they stop at the first point here. Now, this may be true as to the narrowest sense in the way Paul may have intended this. But I prefer to add the second facet that relates to what Paul points out in 2 Corinthians 5. Because of the cross, we view men, including ourselves, differently. Every person is one for whom Christ died. So the idea is, the world has been crucified to me. The, every individual in the world is one for whom Christ died, and therefore my perspective of that, the world in, in that way has to be different. Then Paul states at the end of verse 14, and I to the world, supplying the sense of the context we could read it, and I have been crucified to the world. The believer's fundamental basis, his framework, his outlook for living are radically altered through the application of the cross of Christ to the individual life. 
Paul expressed this earlier in Galatians 2.20 where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Now there are two facets also to this mindset. And we see the parallel of these two to the first half of the verse. You see in, in the first points, the world system is rendered in effect inoperative and therefore on our side, we have to reckon that to be true. Have you seen that principle before in other ways? We have been raised up with Christ. We reckon that to be true. We've been baptized with Christ. We reckon that to be true. These things are true, but they don't become real until we reckon them to be so. So again, we see a parallel. And then the second parallel, we view men differently, and therefore, his point here is, we have a different obligation toward men than we formerly would have had or had would have understood. Now we rushed through this last time. This is where I want to recover that ground. For reckoning one severed to the world by the cross, turn first to Romans chapter 8. We'll start at verse 8. I think we squeezed 20 minutes into 10 minutes, so I'll squeeze 20 minutes into 15. <laughs> or hopefully less. Uh, Romans 8, verse 8. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So we reckon ourselves dead, as it were, to the former mindset. Now we adopt a new mindset. And let's couple this with Romans 6, verse 11 through 13 to see kind of a more explicit expression of this idea of reckoning this to be true. 6, 11 through 13. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So kind of those two together bring about a, more, a broader expression of that biblically. Now, more specifically in explicit relation to the world, we find our orientation should be directed as we find in 1 John chapter 2. Let's turn there. 1 John chapter 2, we'll read verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So this is what has been rendered inoperative, and we can therefore reckon ourselves dead to, not affiliated with, able to set it aside. And we noted in Paul's personal testimony to, to this in, in some in a more broad way, I guess, in Philippians three, seven through eleven, that he said that those things that were gained to him, he, have count, he has counted these things as loss for the sake of Christ. He and, and on and on it goes in that passage. So the idea is he had is basically that's a, an expression of his personal application of this truth. And finally, we find this in with a positive spin in Colossians three. 1 through 3, let's turn there. So we have the negative, put it off, reckon it dead, reckon it inoperative. But we, there's a positive way in which we really would be benefiting even perhaps uh, more effectively 
that we can look at this. Verse 1 through 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So that's the positive. You know, we can, there seems to always be two sides to, to these things, but this is the positive side of it. Now for the second facet here, now we're looking at an eye to the world. This is what I'm developing further because we rushed through it, uh, which would be a different obligation toward men now we're looking at. We find an explicit statement concerning the external implications and personal obligations of this towards man in 2 Corinthians 5. Turn back there. I'll read some verses from 2 Corinthians 5 that, that make this more, again, broadly defined for us. We're going to start in verse 15. And he died for all. That's what we're saying. And he died for all. That's the way in which we look at men now. What are the implications of this now? And, the, and he died for all. That those who live should no longer should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Jump down to seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, here's an implication. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Because the world is crucified to me, I am under obligation to relate to the world through the cross, which includes sharing the gospel, preaching the gospel as an ambassador for Christ, uh, representing the gospel. You know, preaching isn't always by what we say. It's how we live. That's a, the most important starting point is having a credible platform from which you can speak. So we have to recognize that our obligations are different and our responsibilities toward the world are different. One place that this is even more directly stated by way of personal uh, testimony is in Romans 1, verse 14, starting in verse 14, and this is Paul. So let's go there. We didn't go there for sake of time last week. Let's, let's go there now. Romans 1, 14 through 16. Paul says, I am debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So isn't it evident by Paul's statement here that he's applying this truth personally? I think that's clear. And, and many times when you see that represented as a personal testimony of a believer, that is applicable to us because it's supposed to be representative of us as believers. We have a tendency, I know, to think that Paul is up here and will always be up here and all these saints way up here. Do you think that's the way God looks at it? Is that going to be an excuse for us when we stand before God and say, well, you know, you know, I did well enough. I... I, I never could see myself being up there. I mean, is it about what we can do with our own <laughs> capacities? No, it's it's not. And I'm not suggesting that we will all ever attain to the, the maturity that Paul did attain to. I'm just saying that it's not an impossibility. It's not a it, there's no barrier to it. If there is, it's because of our choices. Now we find in Acts 20, verse 24, without turning there, one more good reference to the practical outworking, kind of in a more general sense, of this in the life of the believer. And I'll just simply quote it because I wrote it down here. Paul says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Same point there, meaning he had to be willing to sacrifice everything for that primary uh, purpose or objective 
that becomes part of our mindset when we orient to the truth that uh, has uh, through of the cross and it, how the cross radically alters what how we view mankind, men individually, and the world in general. So in wrapping up verse 14, we find in it an expression of the essence of a proper orientation to our new position in Christ, both in its implications to how we view the world of men and how we view our personal relationship and obligations to it or to them. So now let's move back into Galatians 6 and we will proceed into verse 15. I'm going to go ahead... uh, well, let me, I'm going to read verses 14 through 16 before we look at 15 again. And I want you to see how in these three verses it seems to summarize, though it might be hard to make that connection after two plus years, uh, the whole course of the book of Galatians here, the letter. So let's start here. I, he says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Okay, so you know, being closer to it, I could see the connection there. Uh, in verse 14... He affirms the purity of the grace gospel, which we saw at the outset of the letter to the Galatians. In verse 15, he expresses the true basis of the believer's standing, the grace-faith way versus the law-works way, which occupied appreciably the middle section of the letter. And then in verse 16, he recounts the true basis of one's walk, the issue of true spirituality, which occupies verse chapter 5, basically toward the end. So these three verses kind of parallel or summarize his, his primary points throughout or themes throughout the letter. Now, in breaking down verse 15, we first need to note a difference between the, the New King James, King James and the New American Standard NIV. We find in the former, that is the New King James and the King James, the phrase, here for in Christ Jesus. So we have we have the phrase in Christ Jesus in these versions. Whereas it is not in the latter. If you're looking at the New ASB or the NIV, this is simply a case of a difference between the majority and the critical Greek texts used as a basis for these translations. The presence of the phrase does not does no harm to the understanding of this point or the absence of it for that matter since the positional concept of being in Christ is clearly implied by the context and the phrase in Christ Jesus is explicitly included in both texts relative to a previous verse in Galatians, verse, chapter 5, verse 6. So look across the page or flip back and let's read chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Almost the identical structure to that verse as compared to ours. And you see, for in Christ Jesus. Well, in both Greek texts, in Christ Jesus is present. So, there really isn't a problem here uh, in terms of its uh, absence or its presence. And the idea is this might have been brought forward in some Greek texts for Galatians 6.15 because it was present previously in 5.6. Maybe it was the scribe added it as a something he thought might have been left out because it was expressed that way in a previous verse. Now, accepting whatever about that without further comment, we'll focus on the essence of Paul's point here. Previously, Paul had identified the irrelevancy of circumcision or uncircumcision to a right walk before God which is to be characterized, as we saw in chapter 5, verse 6, as faith working through love. So he already established the point that circumcision, uncircumcision, irrelevant. He, here he makes a similar point regarding the irrelevancy to the essence of this, the idea of the essence of faith working through love, which would now be, in our present passage, the basis of, 
of one's life and walk as a believer, which is the new creation. In saying that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything in this context, he, Paul is simply covering the full range of options of approaching God apart from his way. Those of Paul's audience related to life from the perspective of a Jew or a Gentile. Each had its own faulty understanding relative to achieving a right standing with God. In fact, these did not offer anything, as an, in an absolute statement here, toward that, which would be a right standing with God. Uh, it's, it might be hard for us to, without doing a separate session entirely or more, uh, on the time or the history of that time to, to appreciate the mindset of the groups that were involved in facing what Paul was confronting them with here. It really was Jew-Gentile then. It really was a, a more of a, a, polar -y, a, a, a bipolar type of a situation as opposed to us. We have a, a multicultural kind of uh, worldview that we're, we're involved in, as it were. Circumcision has been confronted by Paul because it was the particular form of legalism being imposed by the Judaizers on the Galatians. But it is cited here, again, as representative of any law works based approach to God for the purposes of his point. Uncircumcision rep represents the Gentile as a category of individuals which comprise, of course, the Galatians. To see uh, the both categories express or this connection made, as it were, turn ahead to Ephesians chapter 2.11. And this is kind of more of just a technical point relative to the definition of the uncircumcision. Speaking now to the Ephesians, who similarly were Gentiles, therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hand. So I'm not going to read any further, but the idea is this is how technically uh, these categories are, are understood at the time that this letter was written. And we find that the Gentiles are represented probably by the Jews, as it were, as the uncircumcision, because the Jews represent those who are circumcised. Now, the Gentile mentality was typically pagan in its concept of God, but it was also characterized by its own form of works. Now, additionally, there has always been the mode of thinking of anti-law, or more technically, antinomianism. You may have heard it expressed that way. Knowing that law works is not the way to God has been wrongly leveraged as a means of legitimizing a wrong form of liberty. It could be that in using uncircumcision here in this statement, he could be using it in some way to express the opposite of circumcision that Paul is also ruling against. So the idea is this thinking is also ruled out. If uncircumcision is simply inc includes the thinking that, well, I'm just going to throw off law altogether and that's going to be good, Paul is also ruling that out as a proper mindset. So in any event, everything not according to the new creation is invalid. Now there are other passages that express this both negatively and positively. Turn first to Romans chapter 2, verse 17. And we're going to read a, this whole segment of this argument of Paul as he is confronting various classes of people, the mindset of various classes of people with respect to a posture toward God. Here he's speaking to the Jew more particularly. He says, Indeed you are called a Jew and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. 
You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For circumcision is indeed, or I should say closing, as it is written. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now there's a lot we could to sift through here and there's a lot of application we could make to things we've already seen here in terms of even boasting you see there at the very end uh, Romans 2 9, 29 but the primary point for our present consideration is that conformance to a law based system is not the basis of a right standing before God now Paul did this here through pointing out that a law work system may be satisfied by those who do not meet certain key stipulations of that system, at least the system as it's represented by men, simply because it is not the letter of the system that is important, but the spirit of the system. But even here, in meeting the spirit of a law work system, as the Gentiles may have done, one does not attain a right standing before God because that only comes from a right relationship to God through the Spirit. Turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 18. First Corinthians seven eighteen. We'll read down through verse twenty. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not become be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in that the same calling in which he was called. You obviously noted a close parallel in some respects of this to our passage. In a similar vein, Paul here dismisses any relevance of circumcision to a right relationship with God and counsels, therefore, that there should be no compliance with the ritual to this end. Instead, what counts is a right orientation to the directives of God's Word, which we would see as consistent with life in the new creation, the new life in the new creation. Now, as to the absolute preeminence of... Let's turn back to Galatians 6 again. As to the absolute preeminence of the new creation, we find this phrase as a direct translation of the Greek in Galatians 6.15. Okay, so it's an absolute... There is... It's an absolute directive. This is a literal. It comes directly from the Greek this way. There's not a whole lot that needs to be done with this. The idea of a new creation relates to a creation of something of a new, unprecedented kind and character. Something completely new that has been instituted. So this is a complete change. Not a redo over not a uh, makeover of something that needs to be tweaked. This is a complete, radical, as it were, uh, something new, a new creation, unprecedented in its character. The exact Greek phrase is what we find in the familiar verse that we've already read, and we're not going to go back there, Second Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So there's the same exact phrase. Old things have passed away. Behold, 
all things have become new. Now that all is an absolute all there. So the idea is it reinforces the idea that there's a, there's a complete mutual exclusivity. It's absolutely new, something that never existed in a form in, in its former in that in its present new state. New creation or new creature expresses the new man wrought in the believer's heart through regeneration. But it also relates to the completely new realm within which the believer has been placed by way of position and to which he has been given access by way of provision. In God's plan, this is not an alternative to a right relationship with Him. It is its foundation as that which is completely provided by Him. Let's see the absolute essential nature of, of this in, in various ways. First, regarding regeneration, turn back to John chapter 3, verse 1. John 3, 1. You already know this passage just by the reference. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You must be born again. You must be regenerated according to God's provision in Christ if you are to have a right standing unto a relationship with Him. Pretty simple, right? in its understanding. It, it is. And as such, as such, this phrase, this concept, may be used to separate professing Christians into those who simply adopt the title Christian from those who are truly saved. Many will readily call themselves Christian, but they will reject the title or association with the idea of being born again. Sometimes vehemently, I'm not one of them born-again types. I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of them born-again types. Okay. <laughs> this phrase will separate many out. Now, you, you might find a way to work that into a conversation in talking with someone to see how that falls out. But typically, those who are saved will identify themselves as born-again. We don't run away from that title. We understand that it, it, it uh, brings consternation, but it's a way of clearly identifying, maybe more so, obviously, than the phrase Christian, where we really stand. So through regeneration, the essential nature of the believer, the true Christian, is changed. It's not, as we've seen, that the old man has been eradicated. It's that we have been given a new man with capacities to know the things freely given to us by God and to live in the light of them in keeping with our position in Christ. Now here are a couple of other passages that refer to the new creation or the new nature. Turn again to Ephesians, and this time in Ephesians 4, verse 20. Ephesians 4, 20. We'll read down through verse 24. But you have not so learned Christ if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Just a further, another passage to expand our understanding of the new man, its source and its mutual separation from the old man which still resides. Turn 
again or head to Colossians 3 again. This time we'll start in verse 8 and go down to verse 11. Similar, in, it could be very parallel, as it were, in thinking, as you'll see. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In addition to the parallel we saw with Ephesians 4 relative to the old man, new man contrast, we notice the parallel of verse 11 with Galatians 6.15. A right standing and walk with God is not about circumcision or uncircumcision or any other number of outward distinctions. It's about the new creation. Okay, go back to Galatians 6.15. Now, I'd like to wrap up with a few quotes containing insights that may further help us draw on the implications of this verse. Here first is what Howard Voss says in his commentary, Galatians, A Call to Christian Liberty. He's speaking first of circumcision and uncircumcision as we see in the context. These may affect the body, but do nothing for the soul. Cross-reference Galatians 5.6. But what is significant is a new creation with new life by the crucifixion and resurrection. The new creation is not new in terms of time, that is recent, but new in quality and different in character from the old. It results from a creative act of God which introduces man to the blessing of salvation, implants a new heart within him, and imparts to him a whole new nature. Also, by way of summary, but a bit more direct unto application. This is what David Jeremiah says in his study guide, as it were, Claiming Faith, Finding Freedom, the study of Galatians. What only matters now is that the believer in Christ is a new creature, literally a new creation. The word for new here is kainos. It does not mean new in terms of time, but new in terms of character. Judaism was wrapped up in a system of rules, rituals, and regulations. But Christianity is something entirely new. It is a departure from religion into a supernatural life. Christianity begins with a supernatural experience called the new birth, and it is developed in a supernatural community called the body of Christ, into which the believer is introduced by a supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit by means of his filling and anointing. All of this is radically new and different from Judaism. Circumcision has nothing to do with it. And finally, here is what Ron Merriman offers in his commentary, Galatians, God's Antidote to Legalism. And it's a bit more direct with respect to application and connection with the historic context of the letter of Galatians. He says, The Judaistic legalizers were wrong in both their doctrine and their emphasis. Today, legalists within the body of Christ often mislead by emphasis since their priorities are in the wrong place. Only as a believer equates priorities from divine viewpoint will he, she, get a proper perspective of and balance in the Christian life. It is clear from this passage that the new creation, i.e. the regenerated man within the believer, is of great import to God. The protein of the new man is the Word of God. The catalyst in digesting the Word is the very Holy Spirit of God. The new man cannot go wrong because of these two essential elements of truth, the Word and the Spirit, that contribute to his frame of reference. As Paul says, paraphrasing as you'll see, in Christ, rights such as circumcision are as nothing, but the new man is something. Put your priority and emphasis on the new creation. So, there we have it. I think we've covered <clears throat> that sufficiently and hopefully in a way that has honed our understanding and focus of something that I trust was already fairly familiar. And that's it on Galatians 6.15. We'll, next time together, we'll move on. Getting close. <laughs> I'm getting nervous. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's uh, close in prayer.
Father, we thank you for just your grace, your provision, the reality of the provision you've made for us in our relationship with you that we can lay hold of. Uh, Father, we recognize in many ways that we understand by way of knowledge over and over again, as we've heard, it's by faith. Um, Help us, Father, to see this more directly, more personally, more practically, and being confronted by your word in ways perhaps that we resist so that we would change our hearts or allow our hearts to be shaped according to the image of the one uh, for, uh, in whose image the, the new man was created, Christ himself. So we thank you again for our time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.